focus on my right middle lock heart. Uh, now, uh, sorry, before I do that, I need to ask Elliot to say uh, a few words about the book itself, to put it in the next, and then I'm going to ask Mary to comment upon uh, some of the themes that you've been Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, one or two faces here from the earlier session, but I will address you essentially as a new audience. My name is Elliot Bulmer. Um, this is my second book that we're launching today, uh, Constitution for the Common Good, Strengthening Scottish Democracy after 2014. And it really goes together as a companion volume with my first book, which was published in 2011, uh, A Model Constitution for, for Scotland, making democracy work in an independent state. And I think what I want to do in my opening remarks is really sort of set this, this book in its context. And that is to say, uh, we are in a process of constitutional change within the United Kingdom. The old assumptions of the British Union state no longer hold. And it's not even controversial to say that anymore. The system is broken, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. The assumptions and the institutions that it was based on before are no longer seen as widely legitimate. Something has got to give. The referendum on independence will be an important milestone, whichever way it happens, on that path to a new settlement. But it doesn't actually in and of itself solve very much. Because if it's yes, we are then into a process of constitution building. We then need to decide, fine, we're going to become a state. That's what it's about. It's not about even becoming a country. Because Scotland is a country. It's about becoming a state. Are we to achieve statehood? If it's yes, then what kind of state? Whose state? Who's it going to be run by? Who's it going to be run for? And those are the kinds of questions that a constitution, a fundamental law embodying the sovereignty of the people, setting out the institutions, the values, and the processes of the state, that's what a constitution embodies and regulates. And we'll then be into a process, and this could go on for several years, of building that new state and trying to write down us, ourselves, the sovereign people, ultimately, deciding how we're going to structure this state of ours. If it's no, well that doesn't in the end solve the problem either. Because it's not going to go away. If 45, 48% of the people vote not to be part of the United Kingdom, repudiating the authority of the Crown in Parliament, which has been the, the de facto sovereign for 300 years, then that's a, that puts a, a figure on the extent of the crisis of legitimacy. That's saying we don't want to be part of this anymore. We can think we can do a better job ourselves in our own way. Your institutions are no longer fit for purpose. In the short to medium term, I doubt very much would happen. I don't hold any prospect for enhanced devolution or any of these schemes that might be offered this side of the referendum. But I do think the fundamental problem will still need solved. And the only way that that can be solved will be to arrive at some new constitutional settlement. Um, and then this book also addresses some of how that could be done if the political will were there for some indeterminate point in the future. So that's, that's essentially putting it in its context. The first book deals with institutions, the mechanics. How do you elect a parliament? How do you choose a first minister? How do you dismiss a judge? How do you appoint an ombudsman? Those kind of dry bones mechanics of a constitution. What this book does, and this is really in response to what I felt coming back from people as I've been around the country uh, listening at, uh, at public events, is people want to talk about values, they want to talk about principles, they want to talk about identity. So this is setting this constitution in its wider context beyond the mechanics. The mechanics are important, but they're not the be-all and end-all. And actually, this book tries to address this question of, well, how prescriptive should a constitution be? What does a constitution have to say about who we are and the values that we, as a society, hold in common? 
So it just takes a little step back to look at those broader uh, themes. Um, the other thing that this book does is address questions of process. Because how we get there is almost as important, I think, or as important as, how, as where we end up. The journey is important as, as the destination. Because we learn on the journey. Um, and those of you who are here at the early meeting, um, Robin might well uh, mention it again, but you know, the learning to be citizens point that he made, I thought was a really valid one. That we, we learn to be citizens through the process of taking charge of a country that's not for Alex Salmon, not for the SNP, not for Scottish nationalists, but ultimately a country for everyone. The res publica, the public thing, the thing that we hold in common. And, and I think this is such an exciting time to get involved, and such an exciting time to start thinking about the institutions, the values and the processes on which we're going to build a new state. Thank you. Thank you. And at long last, Mary, thank you for being so patient. Uh, you and Kenyon have been, uh, have been on track. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Perhaps you'd like to comment on some of these remarks, and also some of the remarks that you've <laughs> I'm going to find it a really difficult uh, job to do this, because many of the things that have been said earlier in the earlier meeting uh, by Robin, who specifically, I mean, Robin, Robin is famous for having established the common way for having published academic paper after academic paper, really well researched, amazing stuff about what kind of Scotland we could live in, how we would shape it, how we would go about it. And Elliot, of course, has, has produced this, I think, amazing book. And I only actually managed to finish reading Elliot's book this morning um, at about six o'clock. Hmm. And I desperately wanted to read it again right away. Not actually 100% because of what it outlines, but actually because it's a damn good read. It's actually written in a language that I can understand. Now, all of us who are here this morning have been billed as experts of one kind or another. And the one thing that I most certainly am not is an expert in the Constitution. But I have become increasingly passionate about the need, the absolute need, and actually not just for Scotland. You know, several people that earlier today asked, what will happen if there's a no vote? Well, a lot of things will happen or will not happen if there's a no vote, but for me, Part of what I will want to be doing is actually arguing that the UK must have a constitution which within it addresses the needs and actually of the different regions as well as the different countries and nations of what's currently in the United Kingdom. So I don't think that this goes away and I don't think that Eliot's book becomes an irrelevance um, should that happen. Over the last year, I worked out, I've attended 58 meetings in connection with the referendum. I've spoken at some of them, but at most of them I've gone not to hear actually what the speakers on the platform have had to say, Patchy Robin, but to hear what questions the people were asking and what their interests were and what was motivating them to come. Because the most remarkable thing to me about the whole referendum thing is the engagement of ordinary people. No, nobody's ordinary, they are extraordinary and their interest is extraordinary in what's going on. And several things emerge. One of them is that a lot of people have been motivated by the illegal war in Iraq. And they actually want to live in a country where that is not possible again. Others have been motivated by the by, by trident, by, by, by the possession of a weapon of mass destruction. And ironically, I found it interesting that while the no campaign on the subject of trident argues that, well, it's only going to be relocated to south of the border and that makes no difference, they don't recognise that people feel passionately that they do not wish to be responsible for it anywhere. And this comes back to the sovereignty question that is so important here. 
Because somebody who said to me, actually, um, at an early meeting, this business about the people will be sovereign. Why it's important to me, she said, is that at the moment I'm a subject and I want to become a citizen. And that person at the meeting was someone I had urged to go to a meeting because I, I've been working as a home carer for the last three years and she was one of my colleagues. She's not a member of a political party, she's not a member of a trade union, she doesn't have an undergraduate degree, let alone a postgraduate degree. But for her, this idea that now you're a subject, that you could be a citizen, crucial. Now for that reason, I think what Elliot has spoken about and, and what Robin spoke about earlier, about the participation of the people in drafting the constitution is key in deciding what it should be. Now, the, the widest consultation process that has happened in recent years probably happened between 1977, no, not 1997, in Britain, I mean, in 1997 and 1998, when the new Labour government, and I use the words with the ca initial capitals, uh, because I'm a member of the Labour Party still, for my sins, the new Labour government <coughs> undertook the first major strategic defence review since the end of the Cold War. And that strategic defence review was meant to resolve a lot of problems that the Labour Party felt it had had in its electability because it was felt that it had no interest in defence and security of Britain. And the first government, the first duty of government is supposed to be the security of its citizens. So they said, we're going to have this amazing public consultation. There were nearly 2,000 meetings up and down the United Kingdom in village halls, in town halls, in community centres. The Secretary of State for Defence went on radio phone-in programmes. You could phone in and say, well, I think our defence should be such and such. It failed to do a number of things. It failed to address what Dr Laura Cleary, who's a security expert, says. She's also a constitutional expert, in, 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 interestingly. And Laura Cleary says that you have to ask two fundamental questions, and they are, what is it that we seek to defend, and why do we seek to defend it? And what's usually given as the answer to that is we want to defend our way of life. Now, who defines what is our way of life in a post-empire state? To have the people engaged in answering these questions <coughs> is part of what is formulating constitution for an, a nascent state, which is what we're going to become. That is crucially important because one of the reasons why independence will not, there is no shortcut to independence. If we remain part of the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom retains responsibility for defence and security. And we Scotland don't have the same. It isn't the same. It doesn't matter how many extra powers you give. Incidentally, not to the people of Scotland, but to the Parliament of Scotland. It's not giving sovereignty to the people. It's giving sovereignty from Westminster to the Parliament. And basically, you're just getting the status quo plus. That's why it's called Devo Max and not Independence Light. That's the difference. I could go on forever on these subjects. I'm tremendously excited about the next week. I agree with them 100% that what is now terribly important after the referendum is the process and how we make it work. And the other thing that the Strategic Defence Review consultation failed to do was to make it all inclusive. Not all inclusive as to who could take part, but in terms of the questions that it could address. So, for instance, it said, we are keeping nuclear weapons and the nuclear deterrent. We are going to commission certain kinds of fighter planes, which we commissioned in NSCAT. These things were off the table. They couldn't be discussed by the people. The Strategic Defence Review failed, I would argue, 
because although it was billed as the most inclusive, most discursive, it didn't actually. It just it let you have your say, but it didn't listen to what you said. That's what the constitutional process in Scotland could do, should do, and I think that Eliot's book, Constitution for the Common Good, is an excellent building block, a starter for that, a manual as to how it could be done. Thank you. After tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, had I not been chairing this meeting, I would have come along to listen to these excellent speakers. <laughs> Uh, it's been an absolute delight and, uh, and sparing everyone blushes. Uh, I, I have really enjoyed it sitting here. It's been, it's been so good. And last but by no means least, I'd like to introduce Kenya Wright. And again, previous indulgence for taking so, so long to get round oh. to that. Uh, Kenya is also president of the Constitutional Commission and I'm honoured and delighted that he's able to join us uh, this morning. Thank you very much. While Elliot was speaking, I was making various notes. And one of the things I wrote down was two sayings of Thomas Paine. And it seemed to me summed up some of it. And one of them is, a constitution is not an act of parliament, but the act of a people constituting its parliament. Which is relevant to the last point that was made, of course, a moment ago by Mary. And the second thing I wrote down was, is I was saying, the duty of a true patriot is to protect his country from its government. <laughs> so I think that's a good starting point. And the other thing I picked up, of course, very interestingly, was that phrase which, in one sense, sums the whole thing up, sums the whole argument up. Nothing about us without us. I came across that. I was for a time uh, in Tayside. Uh, a consultant to the NHS, and that became very much a patient slogan for, for its access to the NHS. No decisions about us without us. And that seems to me is at the centre. But what I, was, what I want to do is to reflect a bit on some of my own experience, but on the things in the Constitutional Convention which raised constitutional issues which are directly relevant to this debate and to what is written in this book. Let me, by the way, once confess at once that I'm afraid I haven't had time to read every single word of this. And uh, as in many, as with many books, I'm afraid I've relied on the introduction, the summary, and the conclusions. Uh, but those are sufficient, I think, to, to, to persuade me now to go back to the whole of this with much greater attention and care. The Constitutional Convention began with the claim of right for Scotland. The claim of right for Scotland was a simple statement that the people are sovereign. The sovereignty of the people. The people of Scotland have a sovereign right to determine how they will be governed. And to this day, I still don't know how all those politicians from the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrat Party lined up to sign that document. And did they, did they even begin to realize that by claiming the sovereignty of the people, they were denying the absolute final sovereignty of Westminster? Seems to me, to this day, I have never really had an explanation of that. There was only one honest politician in that sense, uh, and that was, uh, do you know who that was? Tam Deal. Tam Deal, mm. who said openly, I can't do this. Mm. But uh, at least he was honest. So the, but, but the point I want to make really is that that challenge of sovereignty is, is at the, the heart of this. Uh, we, went, we went on then, sorry I'm losing my place here, my notes are so scribbly. We went on to produce for the Scottish Parliament, uh, sorry, to, to produce another statement so the first statement which is relevant is clearly the, the claim of right for Scotland, clearly the sovereignty of the people and how that sovereignty is exercised. And that was raised, and that second question was raised for us by the four basic principles of the Scottish Parliament. And these were actually accepted by the Constitutional Convention, but they were also accepted at the first meeting of the Parliament by the Parliament itself. And I'll just reiterate three of these. 
The fourth one was equal opportunities. The first one was that there should be sharing of power between the executive, the parliament, the government, let's say, the parliament, and the people. The second <coughs> was that the executive should be responsible to the parliament, and the parliament be responsible to the people. And the third was that there should be a participative approach to the scrutiny and development of policy and legislation. That third one seemed to me to be extremely important. Now, all of these have a weakness in them. And the obvious weakness, and this is what I think is being addressed here, there's an obvious weakness that it's all very well to say sharing of power between these three. But the power, even the present power, of the first two are quite clearly defined. The power of the people is ill-defined, hardly defined at all. And it does seem to me that that is the point at which there has to be much, much further discussion. How, you know, it's all very well for the interim constitution which has been produced by the Scottish Government to say the sovereignty of the people. It's, it's a key point. But how is that sovereignty of the people actually to be addressed? How is it to be constitutionally guaranteed? And it seems to me that that question is not one for which we yet have an answer, or will the answer may become, I think, now in this publication and in the discussions that I hope will follow this publication. Because it seems to me that if there is a yes vote, and I think that's still a, consider a, a, a real possibility. But if there is a yes vote, we then have an interim constitution. And I would like to hear from Elliot at this time some of his comment on that interim constitution, both on its process and its content. Now, I may be challenging you to something that uh, has, is a bit thorny, shall we say, certainly controversial. But I think it's very important that that interim constitution, which after all is supposed to lead to the Constitutional Convention, which will then form the permanent Constitution of Scotland. So if there's a yes vote, that is the path already laid out. But, but there is a, a strong case for vigilance, vigilance of the word I have used, to, be, to look very carefully at how that is being developed. But of course, if it's no, well, as Eliot said, if 40 or 40, if 45, 48 percent, or whoever said it, it wasn't clear, uh, if 48, 45 percent of the people vote to leave the United Kingdom in its present form, then it seems to me constitutional change, and accompanied by that, alongside that, there is this awakening of consciousness in Scotland, this amazing awakening of politicization of the people, uh, and um, beginning to look more carefully at the constitutional implications of the country they live in that these things combined make constitutional change of some kind really inevitable. Uh, it seems to me that is, uh, that is the, the way forward that we have to go. I confess that for a long time I wanted and struggled to achieve the part policy which would have given us an autonomous Scotland within a reformed United Kingdom. Uh, to this day, I still believe that if there is a no vote, I think that's the path along which we've got to go again, using all the resources we can, organization, organizationally that we can, to uh, argue for that. But notice it does depend on reforming the United Kingdom. Because, it, and that is exactly what was denied. The doors were closed, the doors were slammed shut. Way back in 2009, even before the SNP majority level, was a minority government, I argued for a second question to be on any ballot paper. And I continue to argue for that. And of course, the door was slammed shut on that, not by anybody in Scotland, but by Cameron. Uh, and and, and my, my hope had been, my hope had been, that if there was a second question, we would have been able to have a serious discussion, again, which would have led away from the set of option being just more devolution, because of course devil, power devolved is power retained, and the, the de the, all the offers being made of further devolution even now, even if these offers are genuine, 
and are maintained, which I personally would considerably doubt. Even if they are, then devolution remains power by gift. Uh, Many use the expression given, giving as power. But the Constitutional Convention always used the word right, power by right. And we, we thought, we tried to entrench, we actually said, and I quote again, it, it, we are adamant that the powers of the Scottish Parliament should be entrenched so that they should not be subject to revision or cancellation by any I can't remember the exact ending, but that, that entrenchment was an intention. And we even set up a commission under, under um, Joyce McMillan's chairmanship to look at how that could be achieved. And that commission said in the end, it can't. It can't. There can be no entrenchment unless, so long as the present system remains. Therefore, that's the kind of question we have to ask. Now, there's just one last comment on that. And that is, uh, recently uh, I and Elliot too, I think, have given evidence to the Political and Constitutional Reform Committee of the House of Commons. And they have just published on the 10th of July a document they call The Future of the UK Constitution, a major consultation by Parliament on a new Magna Carta. Now that document, if I haven't had time to read this, I have hardly had time to read it, because that is 450 pages long. But it does put forward three options for the future of the United Kingdom. And the third option is a <coughs> constitution, an actual written constitution for the United Kingdom. Uh, and a, a, a consultation period has just begun, which ends rather shortly, I think, on the 15th of January. Uh, on this document. Now the Scottish response to this document, this, this document, as far as I can find from the bits I have read and from my conversation with the chairman of that committee, uh, it seems to me that the Scottish concerns are not addressed so far in this document and because it's a, for a UK constitution which will not take account of the specific and, and, and distinctive needs of Scotland for her, for her own constitutional rights. Uh, but it might be, there might be a case for making the case and seeing whether that case is accepted within this, which I think is a genuine process, seeking some kind of constitutional reform and may provide a way forward if there is a no vote. Uh, I think I'll stop. There are lots more notes here, but uh, they're all scribbled and they're all over the place. <laughs> and uh, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Consensual process is the best basis for a stable democratic future. Here, here. Hallelujah. 
It's not about just the words. It's about the state of mind of a nation that can create its own constitution, that can write it, that can build it, and that can make it, that can believe it is a nation of citizens who actually has that kind of involvement in society, that can shape it, and that can create that kind of society. Um, there's something else in here, this is page 160, which really caught my eye, um, and where Elliot writes, the quality of democracy, be it its institutional forms and written constitution, be its institutional forms and written constitution ever so excellent, ultimately depends in large part on the character, excellence, and public spirit of the people. And once again, I could not agree more. I'm not a constitutional expert, and I've argued many times that as far as I'm concerned, let's get a really strong constitution, and then let's be clear that really successful societies function because they have well-functioning democracies. And well-functioning democracies are not an act of constitution, but an act of the people. We have seen once again this morning, to my mind, that Scotland is the parliamentary jurisdiction in all of the developed world with the worst media. There's no question about that. There is no other parliament that I'm aware of in the developed world whose media is so pathetic, whose media will not discuss ideas, will not discuss issues, will not come out here. I have absolutely no doubt that if George Fuchs says something daft today, it will make the front page of the newspapers. And yet a work of this quality, this significance, not only to Scotland, not only to Britain, but as far as I'm concerned, to Europe, draws one journalist. Now, this is where we are in Scotland. We are a nation in which its people have, are in the process of overtaking both its media and its politicians. They are coming out to meetings every night of the week, and they're engaged in a debate which is of a higher quality than our newspapers are, and it's of a higher quality than most of our politicians engage in. And this process should extend. It should be extended in this way. If we get a yes vote, when we get a yes vote, we should be extending it by saying it's the process of writing the future, of writing the rules of the society in which they will live in that will take the next step in lifting our people up from being passive subjects of a, a Westminster system which expects that the elite will write the rules on which the rest of us will be run because it is the elite the elite that has the scientific evidence of what the best possible system of governance of us by them is. Now, when we break that down, when we say to people, no, the best possible form of government is the form of government in which people decide what it is that their society will be, when they understand that, then they will walk taller and become stronger, those excellent um, citizens that Elliot writes about in here. This process is enormously important, more important than the words on the page. I was at a debate in Kirk and Tillich on Wednesday night, and the chair said, a good debate doesn't have any heckling. Oh, I could not disagree more. The, the beauty of these town hall meetings that I've had all the way through is that I am this close to people, and if they want, they really can throttle me. Mm. If they think I'm talking rubbish, they will tell me. Hmm. Um, they do not sit passive and be lectured by experts on their future, but they're engaged. They throw things, they shout, they disagree. Hallelujah. I would rather be interrupted ten times than be listened to in silence by people who walk out and don't care. Much better to be engaged. This is the heart of an engaged Scotland. This is the structure of a country which has built itself up from its beginning with engaging its people into the very fabric of its nation. The absolute opposite of Westminster democracy, a 21st century country, not a 17th century country. I am extremely excited um, by a subject I'm going